This is Philosophy versus Improv, where two sages try to teach each other a thing or two, and maybe you, the audience, get something out of it as well. My name is Bill Arnett, an improv philosopher interested in non-improv philosophy. And this is Mark Linsenmeyer, a philosophy improviser, improvising my interest in improv. And our special guest today, introduce yourself. Uh, hello there. I am Chris Rathjen. You might know me from other podcasts such as Hello from the Magic Tavern and Improvised Star Trek. Well, and I'm threatened by anyone else that has has a low voice like me. <laughs> so maybe we should just uh, uh, segment ourselves just immediately that I will I will do the whole thing with this sort of accent just to. OK, Bill is shaking his head. He does not approve. Just be you, Mark. One of the basic tenets of improv. Let's just take it to the field and we'll let what happens happens. Yeah. <laughs> Well, I have a word. I'm not going to get us going on a whole philosophy conversation to get started here. But before we do this, I want to observe some things about Chris. Can you get engaged in some self observation? Say a little more about did you ever take a philosophy class? Oh, yeah, certainly. I took some undergrad intro to philosophy. I like to think that I have a better than average understanding of philosophy just through conversations and, and intellectual curiosity. And of course, it's fun in improv. My play is a little more wordy and a little intellectual. The wordplay is kind of what excites me. So throughout the years, I have fallen in love and played with different ideas. Whether or not I've done so with great academic rigor is probably open to debate. But I have I feel like a, a passing familiarity with a lot of philosophical concepts here in the West. Your ship has docked at a friendly port. <laughs> <laughs> Just say you'll be getting a, a heavy dose of that from Mark and myself. Well, and of course, your involvement with Star Trek. There's a lot of philosophy smuggled into there. Maybe not in the most rigorous way, but there's food for thought. Oh, certainly. Um, Should you kiss green women? Deep philosophical question. The answer is maybe. But yeah. Does the green person consent? Well, and can you handle kissing the green women? That might be a whole thing. Is if you're, well, yeah, if you are the kind of person who your emotional side will take over, and you'll just be caught in this grape eating Saturnalia. That's not the proper adjective. Last rule of being a captain: don't fall in love. Yeah. Well, there is actually a great book that a friend of mine's parents wrote, which examines the role of Star Trek, filling the same kind of mythic philosophical roles in the United States in the 20th century that myths filled for the ancient Greeks. And I think there's probably a lot of truth there and, you know, a lot of different ideas on what is morality, where do ethics come from, what do we owe each other, all that great stuff. I think that's a great observation. And observation, something that happens a lot on Star Trek, they're going out there to observe the world. They're not going there to take down all the tin pot dictators. They end up doing that. They violate the prime directive, but they're there to observe. They're, they're supposed to be invisible. Let's see whether these new lives and civilizations are ready for the big leagues. And sometimes they end up taking down the tin pot dictators within that they didn't even realize were there. Wow. I need to watch more Star Trek. Engagement with the alien does then shine the light back on the self. It is, uh, mm -hmm. are we really any better than the people who have uh, painted half their faces black and half their faces white? They haven't painted it. That's just how they naturally look. But we're going to see them as painted. And are we not ourselves polarized in that way? That kind of stuff. It's probably no surprise that when I started doing, when an improvised Star Trek show came along, it was a, a perfect match for the high concepts that one is already dealing with, hopefully at a late night improv show. <laughs> I don't want to spill too many more beans besides getting that word out there. Observation. Start, is, Observation. Is, is that a way that, is there a way, Bill, or Chris, you're both mm -hmm. the improv maestros here, can start us on some sort of improvisatory exploration that involves that word somehow? You just want to dive right in, Mark. Is that it? I'm in the presence of great experience and talent, and I want to, I want to leverage that. I want to learn from that right now. Fair enough. Something that, as my journey into philosophy has blossomed, Mark's journey into improv has also blossomed. Where do you think you're on in your improv journey? Well, I mean, sometimes I observing just... Observing yourself of your own skills. I've observed. It's how much can you handle that I get off of a session with you and then I go around the neighborhood and I'm pretending that I'm a, a citizen of America, just an, just the average Joe 
a Devo, if you will. And I feel like you've given me a sense of uh, unreality about my general life. And I don't know if I can handle that. So I, it's good to come back to have these supervised sessions. <laughs> well, I hope you're being a little facetious. But yes, we, we can get something going here about observing or observation. I'll get us rolling here. There's something I'm, I'm going to do, Mark, which is another little, I try to get some improv lessons in there as well. There is one in here as well. Let's see if you can observe it. All right. All right. Welcome, everyone. This is the uh, German submarine U-505 here. And Ooh. this is an exciting time. Everyone's signed up for the tour, I can see. And we'll begin shortly as everyone arrives. If you have any questions right now, I can handle those right now. But uh, we'll get started once everyone arrives. What war was this used in? Uh, the Second, Second World War. Mm-hmm. So this is an, an evil submarine? Well, uh, I guess it kind of <laughs> it depends what side you're on, but uh, certainly from our side and for most of the side and for uh, my own political security and safety, I will say that, yeah, this was uh, as a German submarine and their, their political landscape was uh, what we would call evil today. Yeah, it's very dark. I've noticed that the, there's no natural light in here. Can we? We're underwater. That's the we're going to simulate being underwater where there is no natural light. That's the idea. I mean, I feel like you need light. That's good for the soul. Like, it doesn't surprise me that, you know, if you're in the dark, you start thinking dark thoughts. Makes good sense. Because they were in a submarine without sunlight, they turned evil. That seems very reasonable. Was Hitler raised in a submarine? Was this Hitler's submarine? I didn't mean that to be reasonable. But um, this is not. I mean, it's his, I guess his name's on it somewhere. But uh, no, he was. I do not believe Hitler ever stepped foot on the submarine. He signed it, but he didn't set foot on it? Well, as the political leader of his country and his party, I guess he owned, you know, look at Roland here real soon. If you have any questions at all. We're asking our questions. I know. They're just, okay. It's not his submarine. It's not his personal, his personal property. Do you feel some sort of a defensiveness about this? No, no, no. I just, this usually, how fast does it go? How many people are here? Where do you go to the bathroom? I was, I was expecting those things. And you guys just. Well, I don't know. This is my first time on here. This isn't my submarine. Do you consider this your submarine? For the next 22 minutes, I am the docent of this, of this summary. It's in, in my. Oh, all right. So Barry, he's just spent so much time down here. He's kind of gotten a little kooky in the head. You feel that this evil artifact is yours. It's not, I don't feel it's like, I, I just, I go home just like you at the end of the day and I'm out in the sun and I, I experience the, the, the daylight. It's just when I'm giving tours, we're down here in, in the darkness, in the artificial darkness. Huh, so maybe he's bringing the light with his soul, with his personality down to this evil place and airing it out. Is that it? That would be great. Yeah. Okay, sure. I'm bringing, uh, I'm bringing light. I'm bringing light. That's what I'm doing. I've got a little um, flashlight, which I'll be using in a little, it's got a laser pointer on there, which I'll be indicating stuff during the tour. So yeah, that's, that's what I'm doing. And do, do you have a, a pet? Do you bring, bring love? Is there love in your life that you can bring down here and, and uh, I, I love, spread I love to doing the... This. I love doing this job. I love giving tours. Does that count? My uncle had a car that was used in a murder. Yeah. And okay. He, I think he really loved that car. He did. He used it to take his chihuahua to the vet. Was that the murder? Was that the... Separate incidents. Okay. Uh, I mean, eventually, the last time you take it to the vet, that, well, that sort of yes, is a murder. Do we consider that a murder? I mean, it's, it's a mercy killing. Yeah. That thing was 16 and a half years old. I mean, that was way past its prime. And, and it, let's man, not smells. get into this. I know right. you think it was evil to keep the dog alive that long. And I disagree. I disagree. We're expecting about another uh, eight or 10 people here. So, uh, we'll hold for a minute. Do we think that the eight or 10 people will, will help with the vibe here or will darken things? I think it'd be great having people. I think it'd be great. These, these were cramped quarters. You're stuck inside this metal tube with 87 other uh, sailors. So having other people on the tour, I think would go a long way to help us recreate that feel. Was there a lot of murder on the boats? Well, with so many evil people packed in together? I don't think they were necessarily evil. I th they were just doing their job. And, you know, with the, the hindsight of history, we can say that this was a, a terrible thing in a, in a big picture. But these were young boys. Some of them just hadn't seen the world. And here they are, you know, on, on a submarine. So I don't really want to. Just following orders. Just doing their job. Well, I don't yeah. want to say that. That's No, I mean, I don't want to. But we have to put ourselves in, in the shoes of, of different people. And that can be a challenging. Evil shoes. They're not evil shoes. I don't really don't. They're just shoes. I wouldn't be surprised if many of the sailors went barefoot. To be perfectly honest, it's hot. 
It's hot in here. Can we take off our shoes? Please don't take off your shoes. Please don't take off your shoes. My shoes are already off. Sorry. It's sort of a clammy feeling on the on the feet. I feel like I got to get in touch. You know what? Just you can keep here. them off. You can, you can keep them off. Okay. It's going to be better off. if she doesn't put them back on. If you were asked by your captain here. So the captain was like the dictator, was like the law. So if you were asked to say, put, you know, crewmate Ricky, who'd, who had, was sleeping on the job into one of the bays where they shoot out the torpedoes, like, would you do that? There is no documented evidence of a captain ever punishing a, a sailor by launching them out of a torpedo tube. But I mean, I'm looking at these tubes. You could. It's a person sized. It is. Why did, why would they make the bombs the size of a person if that wasn't an option? Well, uh, I, I, you're not really looking too closely all around you. This clearly is a device for shooting someone out under the water. Again, it could happen, but I just, there is no documented evidence of human torpedoes. Well, of course there's not, I mean, there's not room for the audience in here. So you're not going to get a lot of witnesses to any given, I guess you'd have to announce it over the, the loudspeaker. Do you have the loudspeaker well, this would, still uh, here? Are, are we talking about doing this today or are we talking about doing this when the submarine is under the water. I don't know what is part of the, your tour. Yeah, this is, you're the docent here, you said. Hey, I tell you what, if you can get that torpedo door open, it's been shut for 60 years, you can climb on in. How about that? Are you threatening me? Is he threatening us? I think this is more like a cask of Amontillado thing where the reason it hasn't been open is because there's still a body in there. That is oh. how bad the Nazis are. That they would. That's probably it. They filled up the sea, and they had to just keep some of them in the, in the bays. You know, I'm really worried where those other eight or ten people are to get this tour started. Have they prepaid? Yeah. Then what do you care? Let's be honest. That's what you're doing this for, right? The money? Who else comes down to an evil submarine every day except for money? It's not evil. It's a, it's, I mean, it, we try to make the display here contextualize. It is a piece of technology. I imagine when you go home and the green from your money glistens in the sunlight, you feel like all is forgiven, and what, stay, what was in the submarine stays in the submarine, and you can live your life of love and laughter on the surface. And that's great I ain't paid that, you, that much, pal. I ain't, I ain't not paid that much. Go home and, you know, bask in the kisses from your Alsatian German shepherd hound and just tell yourself that this is all just part of it. You know, I also work doing tours of the uh, lunar lander, you know, so... I'm not just here. So I, there's other things I do around here rather than just give tours of German submarines. Was that the dark side of the moon that that went to? Yeah, I didn't know that the lunar lander was also evil. But if you're, I mean, it just seems like that's a pattern with you. So I, I, I don't think, I don't think it was. I don't think it was. What did they eat? Great question. That's a great question. It, when the submarine, it could, it could survive at sea for two months. Now, here's the fun thing. You would load in the canned foods first. So they'd be at the back of the pantry and then so they get all the fresh food on top. But you'd eat through all your fresh fruits and vegetables and bread at the beginning of the trip, first two weeks, and then for the last, you know, two to four weeks, you're just eating out of a can. How does that float your boat, huh? How does that make you feel? Eating out of a can for four weeks, huh? Nothing. No emotional reaction to that. It doesn't sound great. I'll just say it doesn't sound uh, well, great. Thank you. That's, that's usually one of the points we talk about that gets a big reaction from, from the crowd. I feel like fresh food is good for the soul. I feel like fresh food is better for you. I agree. But wouldn't wouldn't some of their fresh food be in the form of excess crewmates that they no. get through the they zero. get through the zero. fruit they get through zero. the meat that they brought and then they you know it's like a human being is a self freshener that until it is killed then it's like uh, you know you can get fresh food but a couple weeks in you know we're gonna go ahead and start the tour now but we have we're a little bit behind so for the remainder of the tour no questions oh zero questions we will just silently judge. Will there be time for questions at the end? We'll see. And saying awesome. Okay. I was real blunt with that one. I got it started real blunt. Uh, is this the bit where we talk about how we tried to bring the word that we started with? It certainly can be. We can. I kind of want to f- try to figure out, Bill, you're saying you were blunt about what the improv lesson was? No, I was blunt about getting it started. I was thinking when I saw observations, I very much wanted to put you all in a position or you're driving something. I'm going to put down just a 4-4 time or something real, just a little rhythm section and let you guys do the observing. Yeah, I guess I kind of went in with, you know, there's the good improv rule that you should be kind of open-minded to situations and see what's happening. But I was also thinking that my own observation is that people are not necessarily that way. So I tried to play observant 
in an observant way, a person who brought a lot of prejudices into a <laughs> setting and perhaps let that work to cross purposes to their own obser- observations. Yes, and I can spill some of the beans of what I had in mind in bringing in okay. observations, which was exactly what you're talking about is the relation of observation to, you're saying prejudice, if we're talking about science, if we're talking about history, even just trying to determine what the truth about the world is, I think the idea is there's, there's a claim that's often made that there maybe is no, observations are helpful when you already have a theory in mind, right? When you're already looking for something that it's very hard to just like, just observe, like, well, what does that mean? Then, then you just bring in whatever bullshit that's, so it's kind of even maybe better to have an agenda that's on the surface, right? We're doing a scientific experiment. We're trying to determine this one thing. We're looking for if this thing is going to happen or not, rather than just somehow we're just going to observe and thereby see the truth of, of the world. You're saying there's no unbiased observation. Every observation you make in some way is some external stimuli filtered through your own expectations and biases. That's at least a, a thing to a theory? consider okay. and how that might work in various domains. So observing the scene, I mean, it seemed like yet another, I think more successful than most that we've done, frustration scene that you were not allowed to leave. Mm-hmm. Um, so that was one thing, although you did silence us more or less at the end, or at least nominally silence us. Who knows how that would have gone if these characters would have been able to keep their traps shut? I don't think so. No. And again, when he said observation, well, we'll do a simple one. The next scene, maybe we'll do some deeper observations and not just, well, I know I'm standing here. What am, what am I seeing? What, what's coming in? What's happening right now? Well, maybe go a little deeper. I'll save that. I'm going to put a little, I'm going to write that down. A little star next to it. <laughs> Don't scientists try to be as impartial as possible? I mean, is their attempt at impartiality a farce? Well, I mean, they kind of set up things to force themselves to be impartial with what with double blind studies and all, because they understand that they cannot be trusted. They understand that people say things like, is this an evil submarine? And once those ideas are in your head, it's hard to operate otherwise. (laughs) Yes, there are whole discourses about how scientific theories relate to individual observations. And are we in, have you heard that term, a scientific paradigm? Sure. I've heard, I don't know <laughs> what it's referred to. Thomas Kuhn was the guy who was sort of famous for this, who was a historian of science. He was not actually even a philosopher with the idea that we don't question our basic assumptions. So that if you see something that looks like magic, you don't just say, oh, I guess science was wrong all along. Like, no, you, you kind of have, this is the thing that we're studying. And we will, as you said, Chris, you know, try to be not prejudicial about like, my funding is based on my finding this thing. So I really am going to find yeah. this thing that they're on the lookout for, but they're not on the lookout for let's knock down the central tenets of our whole worldview, because that's just not the way science works. You would need a lot of pushback. You know, if you see one instance that looks like a miracle, you just say it's a trick. It's videography. It's a, a con. It's something. Isn't that from our point of view where science has provided a slew of answers already? Where it's like, yeah, science is, it's done a lot for us. So if I see something weird, it's like, I bet science has an answer. You know, you know, 2000 years ago, when you're in a world where there is no answer, where magic and mystery are the solutions to most problems, then when you see a problem, you're just applying your own, well, philosopher priest said it's rainy season because the gods are sad and crying. So I should plant my crops. So if I see something else weird, it's like, you know, I bet the philosopher priest has an answer to why. All the birds are dying. I don't know. That's horrific. But you know what I'm saying? And the paradigm in the past was not a science solves everything paradigm. Well, I wonder also if we were kind of in a nothing solves anything paradigm prior to science. Like we are sort of spoiled now that things work more often than not. And 2000 years ago, the priest king's proclamation was as good as anything you were going to get. There wasn't a competing idea on the table. And, you know, sometimes they're like, oh, yeah, that's probably it. Or maybe it's not. I got to go to work out in the field either way. So, yeah. The phrase, well, have you considered that wasn't invented until about 1200? The word answer wasn't even invented. I mean, as soon as you have religious pluralism, though, right? As soon as you have the foreigners bringing their gods, then there's at least some kind of competition. There's at least some opportunity for questioning. Foreigners bringing their idols. Ah, Wasn't that a big thing in the ancient world? Like, 
you go go to someone else and you steal their golden cow and bring it back to your place and like piss on it and like oh we stole your cow we stole your golden horn you know we peed on it. isn't that like somebody back me up isn't that like uh, uh, fraternity see, pranks it, yes like yes, yes. <laughs> that's like five thousand years ago you know and like the babylonians and whatnot they they went over to the assyrians and they took their idol and like see i don't know if that necessarily demonstrates if you really feel like your god is the real god and their gods are just illusions well you're humiliating them but it's not like your god requires that it's only when there's some actual no we've got our gods and they've got their gods and they're fighting somehow and so we by pissing on their idols but that acknowledges that there is actually something to that they're not pure just superstition I feel like that was a, even in early Judeo-Christianity or early Judaism, that it was more, our God is the one true God, but we can still talk about Baal and stuff like that. Yeah, I was going to say, didn't the early Hebrews spend some time dunking on Baal? Wasn't that important? <laughs> Baal is purely an illusion that like, you're just like, ha, you yeah, Can you start a fire? Can you, can you cook some meat? <laughs> nope, you can't. Well, pretty weak sauce, Baal. It kind of gives credence to your own God. If I, you know, I steal your uh, golden chalice and I defile it or something, that kind of gives cre- I, I am saying that golden chalices have power. They're meaningful. And I believe that they're meaningful because I'm taking the time to take a dump in it. So that means that my own golden chalice, which is not a golden chalice, it's a mother of pearl basket. I don't know. It is also powerful. Is that acknowledging that their chalice is powerful and you think that that's real? Or is it acknowledging that you want to hurt their feelings and their feelings are real? Wow. Both. All of it. It gives credence to the notion of idols and it gives credence to the notion that y'all suck and my people are awesome. That's what I've observed. I'm I'm assuming, Mark, this has got a little tangential to what maybe. Uh, No, no. (laughs) And I think I'm just trying to think about how to transition into an improv scene with this golden material, this golden chalices in their showers as you pour the fluid out of the chalices. I'm assuming at some point in ancient philosophy, the observations were a bit more like that people believed that an observation was the truth. The whole idea that your observation might be tainted. I'm presuming that that's a more modern. I think that is exactly that is something that comes up with even just the idea of like having to test something like that was a big deal. Didn't Aristotle famously like do the start of some observations and then just kind of riff from there? Like, yeah, he, uh, he did a lot of ob- observing. Like there's really boring works of, you know, looking at plants and recording stuff about them. But it wasn't the idea of, OK, well, let me think of a theory and see if I can show how that's wrong. And then if I can if I can't show how it's wrong, well, I guess it's pretty good. Bees like flowers and cows like flowers. So I'm going to stop there and just assume that bees come out of dead buried cats. (laughs) Boom. Have you observed Wasn't that one of his hits? (laughs) (laughs) I have never read the, those particular works of biology. (laughs) Yes. There is this thing about, I remember it must be the man, the seed who provides all the genetic material that the womb is merely a passive place that fetuses hang out and grow. And, uh, I'm not sure where you'd get that. I mean, (laughs) I've heard that babies are more likely to look more like the dad so that the dad won't kill them, right? If they look just like the mom, then the dad might be like, ah, I don't know. This doesn't look like my child. Chop, chop, chop. I've heard that with other animals that like hyenas, apparently, they can't even tell genders apart from each other. So it's like the dad doesn't even know if he's maybe... He made babies and doesn't even know if the babies are boy babies or girl babies that they can't even tell. So it sounds like there are places in the animal kingdom where observation is not practiced as closely as we would endeavor for it to be done here. I would say smelling observation until you can smell the golden showers. You don't know. Why did I go there? Mark, (laughs) I I feel bad immediately. I have a special thing and I've learned my lesson from just blasting through the chat to take extra special care that it's only going to the other person. But it's what I was kind of something I did a few times in that last scene. I'm just going to send it to Chris here. So he, he, he's armed with it and he might be able to, to use it too. So there it goes. I hope that makes some sense. And you may have recalled times. I didn't, I didn't leverage it fully. That was kind of, you know, cutting down some shrubs with a chainsaw here, but uh, something may come up in our next scene where I can leverage it more fully. Do you feel like, to tell your improv lesson that you need to start the next scene, or can we have Chris? Start Anyone the next can start. Scene? Chris can start. You can start. I want to leverage our, our guest. It doesn't matter. All right. Be leveraged. 
Yes. Okay. All right. Uh, well, thank you, everyone. Of course, it's an open bar. So yeah, if you want awesome. a drink, just, just go ahead awesome. and uh, get a drink, and then we can uh, uh, we can sit down and we can uh, we can start talking about how we're going to uh, to plan this this thing. Yeah, um, yeah. You nervous? You nervous? Yeah. I mean, it's weird. It's strange to plan your own wake, but you know, uh, it's going to be fun. Yeah, dude, dude, it's going to be awesome. And right. I'm I'm here to answer any of your questions. I've overseen fourteen of these pre-planning sessions and a few of them did turn into very imminent wakes because things got so acrimonious but 13 and a half of them went swimmingly so i think I, I i'm can, not worried i'm not worried yeah this is mostly precautionary i do hope i'm going to come down the mountain but yeah, yeah, yeah. i made a big boast obviously that i was gonna climb kilimanjaro uh i'm gonna uh but if i don't I just want to make sure I'm remembered properly. So, yeah. hey, everyone here, uh, raise your hand if you're going to die. I think I see all the hands up. All right. Yeah. We, we should all be so fortunate to have a hand in our own memorial. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I kind of want to do this right. How do people usually do these? What's the standard here? You've taken the first step. You've decided to open this forum and get everybody's opinions. Ultimately, your opinions are the ones that matter now. <laughs> yeah, but when yeah. you're not present, then uh, you don't know who's going to jump in and take over and impose their vision on this. So this is a, a way to get your thoughts out in a sensitive way, in a way that is you're communicating well with your friends here, but yet you can be absolutely clear on what music, what beverages, just all the details, how many flowers, what colors the flowers should be. So we can start, I think, with an overall theme. I think just, is this solemn or is this a party? Uh, you know, I, I, which would you like? So I sent, I sent that email and, uh, some initial ideas. And I think like the first thing we want to do is I have second thoughts, some things. So like no chumbawamba. Obviously, if it's awake, I'm not getting back up again. That was perhaps. It's a it bit of a dishonest. thin slice. That's a, that's a thin yeah. slice. Uh, are you saying no party wake? Do you want a party wake or a solemn wake? Definitely not a I'm never going to die wake. That, I realized, was a mistake. That's the wrong vibe. That was the attitude I went into this with, and I think, obviously, I did die if this party is happening. So so, so back off a little on the I get knocked down, because that would be a tragedy. Dude, I will make sure that any song on the playlist is not in any way ironic or tragically coincidental. All right? <laughs> That's my solemn promise. All I want to know is, am I playing somber music? Are we playing chamber music? Is this quiet? Is this wine and cheese? Or are we, is it going to be a, a celebration? You know? Yeah, yeah. I guess wine is classier. We probably should switch to wine from beer, right? It's your wake. You need to, you need to choose. You need to pick one. I kind of feel bad. I feel like I'm already making this wake all about me. And like, this is your special day. This is the day that you've been waiting for literally all of your life. Yeah. Okay. I guess, is it rude to be like, hey, beers are on me, everyone? Is that a thing you can it's say? not rude at all. That's not rude at like, all. Because wine is on me. It just doesn't sound like a thing I'd say, you know? No, you won't be here to say it. <laughs> the people will arrive. We'll either tell them this is going to be at 2 p.m. on a Sunday, dress appropriately, and they will know. They will, People will know. All right? Or we say Saturday night, 7 p.m. at Gulliver's. All right. And people will know what that means. All right. You just need to pick. Is this solemn or is this a party? All right. Well, if, if I may suggest, so a lot of my clients do, if you feel like it shouldn't be all about you, you can make a bequest so that part of your possessions are going to go to a particular charity. And then that charity can be part of the branding, part of the theme part of the tone. So say if you want to support the aquarium, we have a wonderful aquarium in town here, and then it could be sort of an under the sea theme and maybe even bring a little uh, a squid for touching because by comparison to your dead body, which may or may not be rotting at the top of the mountain, a squid is, uh, you know, it's nice. It's, it's nice to feel. And I promise the invitation will not include the phrase a squid for touching. <laughs> All right, that's that won't occur. We'll we'll class it up. The Berkmans, they had a squid themed and it was very classy. It was only it was very expensive wine. Squids are are surprisingly intelligent. I have heard that. 
Uh, they probably don't do things like bet that they can climb Kilimanjaro, right? No, they don't. But A, you are. You can. Right? Yeah, may- probably. May- maybe. Probably not. Probably you, not. Oh, no, come on. You I'm, spend, that- I'm gonna I'm going to put more money on this than on the climb, honestly. And that's only appropriate? I mean, your body, again, will probably never make it down. It will probably never be found if you, in fact, perish up there. So, for instance... A lot of my clients like to have the life-size gold bust created of yourself, uh, and then the worshipers, the the attendees can gather around it, and instead of having a, a casket as you would at a normal wake and, and see the body, you'd have uh, you know perhaps the squid over to the side, but the center would be the gold bust that then could be uh, praised. All the ecomiums uh, coming your way could be lauded, could be put toward this graven image. Ah, man. Yeah. I feel like I'm already, I'm taking up, uh, prime time at Gulliver's on Saturday. And that feels like a little indulgent. That feels indulgent. I'm writing it down. I'm writing it down. I'm not sure I should. Maybe the wake should be just a uh, wake from home. Like you can just like check in maybe online on Facebook that you've checked in to the wake. Cause you know, like the bust that just seems. I don't know. That that seems like a lot. And then Saturday, like people, Saturdays are so busy these days. Uh, All right, let's like, do this. Let's do this. Would you say you have more friends in your peer group or you have a bigger extended family, including old people and young people? Which would you say? I guess friends. Yeah, Boom. friends. Then it's, a par- then it's a party wake. Then it's a party wake. Okay? That just answered. All right? We're going to be at Gulliver's all night. And okay? y- you are worth it. I mean, when your friends dance about your statue, we can put ribbons that are tied to a pole coming out of uh, the top of your statue's head, and they they prance around and they chant. They're going to be just thinking about you, and it's a really... A maypole? A maypole? Are you suggesting like a maypole? It's a popular request. I mean, it really, it makes the, the deceased the center, literal center of attention. Should we build a wicker man as well? I mean... It is not unheard of to burn something. I mean, the, the fire codes in the particular venue you've chosen probably won't allow that. They do have a dumpster in the back. It is a little you know, dicey when you take your wicker man in the back dumpster because you, I mean, it just really depends how nice the alley is. Should we go check that out? Now, let me ask, what if I live? Can this be a swing party? Can this like be a party for me living? Because the party you're describing sounds like a very, very nice thing to attend. And the, the sort of thing that a person who successfully climbed Mount Kilimanjaro deserves, not the sort of thing that someone who shot their mouth off and got themselves killed deserves. Like, is this, can we maybe repurpose this if I do manage to live? That is a great idea. Y- yes. I, yes. It's a party. <laughs> it's a party. A couple beers down, no one will know what it's about. All right. <laughs> <laughs> but I, but I, I don't want you to have that loser mentality if you don't make it. I think if you seed with the various guests, if you say, you know, if Kilimanjaro strikes me down, I will come back more powerful than you could imagine. If you just kind of make that your theme for the weeks before you go. Maybe. Yeah. Okay. I like that. So I can like say to everyone, like Kilimanjaro can't beat me. And then, all right. Can this stay at this table? Can stay at this planning meeting? What if? I say I died on Kilimanjaro, and then at the wake, I reveal that I lived. And maybe I'll just skip the actual Kilimanjaro part. I'll just tell people I died on the mountain. Or, you know, we'll have someone tell someone I died on the mountain so that I can reveal myself in my awesomeness at the wake. I think that is a expensive, emotional ask on all of your friends and family, some of whom may never forgive you. All right. Oh, but they'll forgive me if I die because I climbed the tallest mountain on a dumb bet. They'll yes. forgive me you, for that. You, they will be so relieved. There, right? See, and yes, Mark knows what I'm talking about. I'll tell you. So the, the goal. Sure, let's do it. Let's do it. Let's do the surprise. We'll get a giant cake like Kilimanjaro and say, hey, he, he died. And then you jump out of the cake. All right, and we can put pasties with sparklers on your see, chest. See, How about that? A cake might be a little tasteless, but the golden idol, you know, if you just make the shape of it, and then you can actually be inside of it, and then you can break out as if, you know, breaking out of the statue to reveal the essence. Perhaps we could even sell it that you're being reborn. 
That's the sort of thing that feels like worthy of the party room at Gulliver's. I'll just say it. That sounds right. Sure. Done. 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 It's done. And okay. you're going to be naked, of course. Yeah. And Chumbawamba, top of the playlist. Uh, t- yeah. From please don't play it to please do play it. Number one. Great. All right. Shubba. I'll get that down. That's a, it's going to be about $50,000 just for the baseline. But that's, fantastic. I understand. Yeah. Okay. Fan- that's fantastic. Thank you both. Thank you both for being in on this. This is great. This is sure. great. Sure. All right. All right. Can't wait. Um, I mean, you're really, you're going to climb that mountain, right? I, at this point, it seems gonna, really like a distraction from the not, party. Why, why even bother? Yeah. All right. So next Tuesday, then? I could die. I could die on that mountain. Yeah, Tuesday. Tuesday sounds great. All right. No, wait, Saturday. We're doing it Saturday. Oh, oh, oh Saturday. sorry. Sorry. I just, it's a little cheaper. We're sparing no expense for Back from the Dead. It's just that there, <laughs> Saturdays, there might be other events going on. You'd have the back room for sure, but then there'd be some, I think there's like a dentist convention that this... Anyway, we could talk about exactly if a rumor were to circulate before the party, how badly would that hurt your feelings? I feel like that would undercut the party quite a bit. Maybe you should stay in protective custody, Bill, until uh, it seems like you're maybe a security risk at this point. Chris, are you willing to spring for the extra? It, it's only another $3,000 to just uh, keep, at this point, keep yeah. Bill. Yeah. To detain, so you, have a, you have a price for detaining another human. Right? Your fingertips, too. You know exactly how much Well, then you'll be on site to help with more of the decorations, the flowers, sure, and, sure. and such. I will be there. And believe me, I will have my camera phone handy to catch this most amazing of events. All right. Great. I feel like there are a lot of good ideas here. I might, like, let you guys run with it. I need to, like, make some calls to the Sherpas and kind of change the climbing plans to fake climbing plans. I don't know whether that'll cost any extra, but that's on my list now. But, like... Go all out. Golden God busting forth. He is risen vibes all across the board. Can do. All right, gentlemen, please put Bill in the box. Uh, all right. No, that's Thanks. not. <laughs> Let's wrap that and up. See, we can stop there. I don't want to go in that box. <laughs> I don't want to have the fight with you about whether you're going to go in the box. That's not an entertaining scene. <laughs> all right. There's nothing about observation there. So let's Yes, be, there was. <laughs> I made an observation. Oh. I made a number of observations. Whether... Chris intended or not, he struck me as nervous. And that happens in improv all the time. We see something, we observe something, and we make an assumption about it and just roll with that assumption. Yes. Bill, can I reveal your uh, suggestion to me? Yes, you Uh, may. So Bill suggested that I play someone who loses themselves without changing who they are. And I don't know whether this was the right way to do it, but I kind of started the scene as someone who had lost their thread. Someone who, in my mind, was a very confident person and was now having second thoughts about the path they had put themselves on. And then the scene went on long enough that I lost that doubtful person and found the confident person again. That's interesting. I had a slightly different take on it, which would be to lose, in my mind, I was waiting for you to lose your self-doubt and grab one of these suggestions. Well, he did lose his self doubt. He decided he was he was better off a golden god returned from the dead. So, yeah, in front of all of his friends and family at a uh, party bar, going to go over great. <laughs> we, had, we had another uh, morphing, as I think we've discussed in the past, Bill. Between it seemed like at the beginning we were in a crowd. There are other people present that we're not going <laughs> to talk apparently because unless we you know did a funny voice. But then uh, by the end, clearly the security would not have allowed that. It just felt like the audience doesn't care and we can just let that go and don't have to address that. Is that that is something they may have observed me making a call to other people to raise their hand if they, yeah. But yeah, audiences tend to forget those observations. <laughs> There's a selective forgetfulness. There's got to be a name. Come on, in this day and age where fact is called into question. There's got to be a phrase or a name for people conveniently omitting or not valuing what we all agree to be true. I'm looking to y'all. I, I don't know. <laughs> but I mean, well, I mean, even though I said that we had drifted away from observation in terms of sort of scientific theory, what we were talking about before that, of course, I brought that topic in because I thought for an improv setting or just a psychological setting in general, that that is, in fact, much more interesting and useful in our day to day life in terms of that we have theories about people that we meet, 
when we're watching something on TV or whatever, or, you know, people on stage, we have formed very quickly theories about, you know, this is the kind of person, this is the character that you're setting up. And we develop expectations according to that. So that is just a very practical application of this general, there is no theory free observation. It's always taking in information and building on whatever it is that we've built up, even if it's something that we only built up in, you know, the first 10 seconds of you establishing your character. As an improviser, and I'm sure Chris would agree, sometimes not only is it, what did this person say? What were their cold words? But as an improviser on stage with another improviser, what are they going for, quote unquote? They're attempting something. This move they just made, these aren't just bland words. There is an attempt at something to start a frustration game, to start some kind of wordplay thing. So being in on it as an improviser, you might, I might be observing things that the audience doesn't quite see or doesn't put much stock in or, or, or care about. That to me is a, an eye blink or an eye wink that like, hey, I'm starting an improv move or technique here that I know that you will appreciate. Does that make sense? Oh, certainly. Yeah. 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 Sometimes there are, you know, there's movement under the water before it crests and the audience can see it that you out there on stage, you hear the shark coming before the audience sees the fin. So there we go. I hear the shark coming. Can you, you can't hear sharks, can you? You can hear the theme. Oh, oh, the jaws. Yes, yes, yes. Well, and it's probably like in the space movies where they always have, you can hear the explosions in space just because yeah. dramatically that I would think in a shark movie, you should have, if not the music, then when the shark turns and looks at you, it goes, or, you know, it does <laughs> something to indicate to the audience, even though if you were in the water, you would just hear a low shushing. But, uh, you know, important to have in all the good shark movies, they have growling sharks, you know, rah, 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 rah. You know so that when the shark is coming at you, it's got to be scary. If it's just silently coming, that's nothing. I mean, if it's not roaring, then I'm not going to be afraid of that shark. I just like, in all the good shark movies. <laughs> <laughs> but the, the explosions in space, I think, are a great example of less exactly what's happening, but more like, what are we going for? Mm-hmm. And what we're going for is, you know, boom. Yeah. And I wonder if the computer on the Enterprise is like, well, these knuckleheads, these you know, skin bags aren't going to understand what they're seeing on the view screen if we don't add some post, yeah. some, some noises in post. So I'll just... I bet this is what it sounds like. I'll just play that over the loudspeakers and the on the bridge so they can really hammer that home. Well, and people are very verbal. So like in Star Trek, it can't just be that they're looking at a screen. It has to be the computers talking. And I think similarly, actually better than a, a growl, if you just put in all those shark movies like, oh, I'm going to get you, I'm going to get you. You know, and the shark is verbalizing. You know, there's some dramatic license. Of course, we know sharks don't talk, but it would be much more dramatically effective. I mean, I think we've cracked why there aren't more good shark movies is that we're not really taking advantage of all the tools in the toolbox here. I'm going to say there's to make the shark menacing. There is Jaws and then a steep, steep decline uh, before any other shark movies are even on the I was going to say radar, but sonar before any other shark movies appear after Jaws. You know, going back to observation and with, you know, AI and machine learning and all that stuff. And once these computers start learning things like learning how to play chess and how to play Monopoly and whatnot, will they observe the same things that we always observed about them as well? Will they be bound to their programmers biases or will they somehow get beyond that? Well, I have a fun fact about the early days of machine learning, which it turns out was much earlier than I realized it was. We've had some mechanism for it in the eighties. And the fun fact that I've been shared that has been shared with me is that The U.S. military's first experiment was trying to teach a computer whether or not it could identify tanks that had been blown up versus tanks that had not been blown up. And the data set it was given was two sets of photos of blown up tanks and uh, intact tanks. And what the computer actually learned to do was sort between Panasonic film and Kodak film because (laughs) the two uh, photo stock sets were, were shot on different film. So whether or not everyone is observing the same thing that we're hoping is observed is an open question. Yeah. And I hope they started by teaching the computer that blown up tanks are sad because, you know, somebody died in there. Because unless you get the values in there for the computer right from the start, soon they're just going to be making us all into paper clips. Well, we just tell the computer that these tanks were, they, they were destroyed during an A-team episode. So everybody climbed out. Just be- clambered out uh, j- just before the thing exploded. So 
any tank that appears on Panasonic film is an evil tank. <laughs> yeah. They use this very particular processing chemical that just, it's bad for the environment, and uh, you're really better off with Kodak. Their fixer isn't quite so detrimental to the environment. So have we, I think we've solved all the problems. <laughs> <laughs> yes. I think we've answered yes. all the questions people came in with. To you, Mark, and your observation. Now, in that the submarine scene, I did lose a few times without necessarily changing who I was. And an, an example, a very simple example might be when you took your shoes off already. Now, how hard do I want to push to get you to put your shoes back? You know, you said something about taking your shoes off to go on the submarine tour. Some of these ladies, they wear their little thongs and they just, they just come off at the drop of a hat. Well, I'm sure wearing high heels and that's something with, you know, grating on the ground. But how hard should I push in that scene to get you to put your shoes back on? Or should I just let you not have your shoes on? Does that make sense? Yes, yeah, so you had to determine, would that be a fun exchange to get <laughs> somebody's shoes back on? I'm sure we could have made it fun. And my museum tour guide could very well make up their mind that I don't want to fight this fight. I'm not happy about it, but I don't want to fight this fight. And I think sometimes, Mark, on your improv journey, you may come across moments where everyone isn't going the way you want it to go or think it could go, and where you can give up pushing it to go the direction you want it to go, yet find acceptance, even if it's begrudging acceptance. All Does right. That make sense? <laughs> Does that make sense? I felt like we had pretty flexible, so more so in the second scene, we had a, a more flexible, dramatic area of exploration. Whereas in the first one, it was Nazis are evil. You're probably evil for being in here. And we were sort of fixated on that. And it would have been very hard for you to give up, to lose on that. I mean, I guess there was some, oh, maybe you're bringing light into the situation, but that was sort of reversed because your behavior didn't follow that up to make it, to convince us that you were in fact a beacon of light. So I guess we went back to the, uh, oh, I guess, I guess everything else you're involved with must be evil too. And it seemed that, so would your advice have been, you know, that there might've been some more dramatic possibilities in, in somehow giving up on that idea? I'm not sure how to apply that. Well, the idea is every person at some point, a set of stimuli may occur that would make you forget or not care about what it is you think you care about. And sometimes players tie up their identity as their character very, very tightly. And they feel that if they change their opinion or their viewpoint, they might lose their identity and then they don't have anything to play or do. So there might be a situation in one of the alternate universes that we learned about in a prior episode where I chose to push, sir, you really need to put your shoes back on. And there might be one of those universes where you begrudgingly do, but you do so in a way that's like, Oh, okay. Well, you said it. That's all right. Well, that was, that was not essential to the theme. I think the, the submarine being an evil Nazi thing and taking off one shoes, it was, that was a, <laughs> that was a I incidental, the evil to soak up from the deck plates into my souls. Ooh, that's an easy trick to get someone to put their shoes back on is cater to their prejudices. What, yes. what have you observed about them? What motivates yep. them? Whether or not it's what you think mm -hmm. should motivate them. I'm just happy about my S-O-L-E, S-O-U-L connection here. <laughs> the evil sneaking up into your soul. Yes, turning the idea back on them and doing something with it. That would be out of character for you as the straight man who's being frustrated. I could do it in a way that indicates to the audience that it's a joke to the audience, but that you all take it seriously. Mm -hmm. And that's one of those under the ocean, seeing under the sea. I, I just totally butchered your graceful analogy, but uh, <laughs> that I could communicate to my fellow players that I am being serious, that the audience would understand the sarcasm. I hope, I hope I could pull that off. Oh, certainly. So Chris, in witnessing this, we've now reached the point at which you as judge get to determine is the uh, Bill's lesson about letting things go in an improv scene or these vague considerations that we've been having about theory versus observation? Which of those is the thing that you're going to be thinking about more as when you walk away from this is the thing that we've most enhanced the world by including in this episode? I think uh, I am going to say our conversations about trying to figure out how observation applies here, I think is very interesting. Like, what do we mean by observation? Do we mean, are the player observations? Do we mean what the observations the characters are making about each other, about the world? I think that's what I'm going to be thinking about more because I haven't really thought about it in those terms in a while. And going into that and like watching these scenes that kind of unfold 
somewhat intuitively, and then taking a moment to stop and pause and observe them is always a delight because everything's an onion and you don't always take the time to peel into them. But once you start, you can just keep digging down into anything. I'm not upset. I will say that's a Shrek line. Let me just say that right See, now. that's a great observation. I'm, I'm not angry. I'm not upset for losing, but you know, Shrek said it first. Well, look, all good <laughs> ogre movies. <laughs> yes, yes. I will agree. Shrek is unquestionably the best ogre movie. Just, uh, yeah. It may be a higher precipice from Shrek down than from Jaws down. <laughs> what is the ogre equivalent of Deep Blue Sea? <laughs> yeah, exactly. yeah, yeah, yeah. What's supposed to make the ogre stand out in his environment is his scent. So we as audience, since we don't have the smell of vision, at least in most of the theaters in my area, then we should have like a little character that sits on his shoulder saying, stink, 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 throughout every scene involving him. And then you really, you'd feel it in your soul more. There may be a more elegant way of doing that, but I understand what you're going for. That's stink lines. What do you think they, <laughs> the cartoonists invented stink yeah, lines? Yes. Visual stink lines in film. Why restrict it to cartoons? It should be. Especially with modern CGI, we can uh, create stink lines around (laughs) anyone now in full 3D. Yeah, oh, 3D stink lines. That would be like, wow. Whoa, it's coming out of the screen. We can bring like a He-Man stinkor into the Marvel universe now. Yeah. And then you got to have the fly buzz in and be like, whoa, gay ripes. Take a bath. You know, like, oh, even the fly thinks this guy stinks. Well, it sounds like philosophy won this time, but only because... We repurposed the philosophy to make observations about improv. So it was sort of, yes. a, it, is, it is technically the lesson that I brought in, but it was sort of an improv lesson more than that is a, fine. You know. That is fine. Well, thank you so much, Chris. It was just a joy. We would love to have you back sometime. Well, thank you so much for having me on. This was a real blast. I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did. Indeed. And we hope the audience got something out of it. Bye, audience. Let us know. E- email us. Go, yes. to, go to the website. Use the contact form. And scene. Well, that was fun. Some of my favorite improv scenes so far in the show. This was our pin pen ultimate season one episode. It was recorded all the way at the beginning of June. It is now almost the end of July as I am posting this. We've got one more episode in the season with a philosopher guest, Sky Cleary, and then our season finale will be recorded in person, because I'm going down to Chicago next week to do that. We have also, in the meantime, been recording some supporter audio. We did a couple readings from my book, Philosophy for Teens, and now we recorded some on Bill's book, The Complete Improviser. You can only hear those if you go to patreon.com slash philosophy improv or use the apple Podcasts app to become a paid supporter there and the feeds that you get in that way will leave out the auto insert advertisements that we have started doing on the partially examined life network podcast here i don't know what things these people are going to try to sell you i'm grateful that they're doing so so we can continue to make the show but to avoid straining your fingers on the uh, jump forward 30 seconds button. Perhaps you could become a supporter in one of those ways. The episodes also include extra talking, our special post game segment. This one with Chris was quite lengthy, where we talked more about uh, improvised Star Trek and Chris's other projects, but also just about long form versus very long form improv. And we typically give our popular media recommendations. It is a good time. You want to have this full experience. Like our existing supporters, Michael, Sarah, Brett, Nick, another Michael, Helen, Ramon, and Ethan, our current batch of supporters. Maybe you'll hear your name on the air if you sign up. Except actually the supporters aren't hearing this pitch, so they aren't hearing that. I'll have to think about the logical consistency of that. Finally, I want to plug a couple new YouTube things. If you look up the Chicago Improv Studio... That is a new channel on YouTube where Bill has been reacting to online improv videos. So that's kind of neat. Also, I have newly started posting stuff with some frequency to the Ask Chicky channel, which is my little mostly solo improv outlet sort of philosophy satire. 
I don't know if it's funny. I enjoy doing them. Thank you all for listening. Thank you for your sustained interest in philosophy versus improv. Of course, if you are hearing this on, say, the Partially Examined Life feed, I hope you go subscribe directly to the Philosophy versus Improv feed, because if you don't, you're, you're actually missing a lot of episodes. You're getting them later. They disappear from that feed pretty quickly. So information about all things, our Facebook, our Twitter, Instagram, etc., are at philosophyimprov.com. Thanks. I shall sell my soul. I wrote.